Welcome everybody. So good to see Heather and Ronnie here on their holiday, coming up from their holiday to come to church. I thought they were going to have sarongs on, but they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and Ian and Karen coming and sing <laughs> from there. You come from the sarong territory, don't you? Sarong territory? Yes. Why is it sarong? Has it been called that sounds, yeah, that sounds a bit sarong. <laughs> Right, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you for what you're going to do here today. Thank you for what you're doing in each one of our hearts. I just want to say, I take authority over every spiritual force of darkness, Lord, that would raise itself above the knowledge of Christ on this range, and I command it. Your curse to be destroyed in the name of Jesus. You have no right in this place. You have no right on this range. And I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are King of Kings and you are Lord of Lords, Lord. And we just ask you, Lord, to open our hearts to just do what you want to do. Thank you for this word today, Lord. Holy Spirit, I just lay down myself and say, Lord, use this word to change us. Give us hearts open to your direction and correction. Give us hearts and minds open to receive what you want to say today, Holy Spirit. And I just lay down my agenda. I lay down myself and say, Holy Spirit, move. Move, move, move. Touch our lives. We just want you. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in us as it is in heaven. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Lord. Thank you, Lord. I say amen in your name, Jesus. So today we're going to have a chat about something that Paul said to Timothy in one of his letters and it's really relevant to us when we, when we look at the history of, of what was happening, what Paul was talking to Timothy about in this letter. It's relevant to us in this day and age because, well, let's, give, let's go back and, and we'll look at the, the history to gain some perspective of who Timothy was and, and who the, the situation that Paul was writing this letter to Timothy in. So Timothy was the pastor of the biggest church in the world at that time. And this church was in Ephesus and it was also under great persecution. Emperor Nero was the uh, Roman emperor at that time. He was taking Christians and he was um, impaling them on poles and painting them with pitch and setting them on fire and they were basically lighting the road when people walked past. They would just see Christians impaled on poles, burning in the night. And that was happening to the church of Ephesus. It was not only the biggest church, but it was one of the most persecuted in the Roman Empire. So Timothy was the pastor there. And, um, and Paul wrote this um, to Timothy at this time. But I just want to say that if you didn't hear my message last week, I really recommend that you, you listen to it because Timothy also was very ill-equipped to be this great mega church pastor. I mean, Timothy had a uh, Jewish mother and a Greek father. So growing up, Timothy would have been not accepted on either side. It would have been hard for Timothy growing up because the Greeks would have um, not liked the fact that he was a Hebrew, had a Hebrew mother, and vice versa. So Timothy probably had a really hard upbringing in um, and, and where he was where he was growing up and not being really accepted by anybody, and um, and being um, and and having that sort of past, then being the greatest leader in this in this whole region, there was a great weight on Timothy. So, like I said last week, when we talked about all those people that were ill-equipped. Timothy was ill-equipped for this, but he said yes to God. So let's see what Paul says to Timothy. And keep in mind the, um, the climate that Timothy was in. Because Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. And this is in 2 Timothy 4.2, please, Max. Preach the word as an official messenger. Be ready when the time is right. And even when it is, even when it is not, keep your sense of urgency, whether the opportunity seems favourable or unfavourable, whether it is convenient or inconvenient, whether it is welcomed or unwelcomed. Correct those who err in doctrine and or behaviour. Warn those who sin. Exhort 
and encourage those who grow toward are growing towards spiritual maturity with inexhaustible patience and faithful teaching. So this message is relevant to us today because Paul was telling Timothy to preach the word. And for us today, I mean, being a Christian isn't the most you know, wonderful thing in the sight of the world, in society. I mean, we're the most, the word that we preach is unwelcome. It's becoming more and more unwelcome. The gospel is becoming more and more unwelcome. And we are looked upon as unpopular. I mean, we're the only group of people, Christians in this world, which it's okay to rag on or to to, um, make fun of. We're the only group of people where it's okay to call names and um, and to to look at unfavourably in this world. Every other group of people, if you do that, you're called all sorts of names. But Christians, we're fair game. But as unpopular... As we are in this world today, we were, we are nowhere near as unpopular as the church was in Ephesus and Timothy, what he was facing. So what does Paul tell Timothy to do? Does he say, Timothy, lay low till all this blows over. Keep out of trouble and just keep your head down and don't do anything. No, Paul tells Timothy to preach the word when the time is right whether it's accepted or not, welcomed or unwelcomed, whether they think you're an idiot and whether they exclude you, it doesn't matter. Preach the word. Whether they threaten you with death, preach the word. And I know maybe some of you are sitting there thinking, well, Timothy was a pastor. That was his calling. That's what he was meant to do. That's why, you know, that's part of his lot that's his, he's called to do that. He's a pastor. He's supposed to be preaching the word. He's supposed to be doing that. But Jesus tells us differently. Jesus tells us in Mark 16, 15, Jesus says, he said, go to them. Said Jesus, and he, and he said to them, sorry, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Go into all the world. This is our great commission. This is a direct direct commandment from Jesus. This is for all of us, not just for pastors, not just for an elite few. Jesus tells us all to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But what does it mean to preach the word? Because if we don't know what the word is, how can we preach it? It's true. So what is the word? What's this word? That we preach. First and foremost, the word is Jesus. John 1 1 tells us that. In the beginning, before all time, was the word, Christ. And the word was with God, and the word was God Himself. So Jesus is the word we preach. So, but to preach the word, We must know the word. We must have a relationship with the word to be able to preach the word. The depth of knowledge that we have in Jesus, that strength of relationship is only only the depth of knowledge that we can preach the word. We can't, we don't know, if we don't know the word, we can't preach the word. We must be empowered by this relationship with Jesus. Mm. We need to be empowered by this relationship with Jesus. Paul tells us that so clearly in 2 Corinthians 2.15. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We, church, are the fragrance of Christ. Wherever we go, we take Christ with us. Whatever we do, we are the fragrance of Christ in this world. And the strength of that fragrance comes from the strength of our relationship with Jesus. And we can clearly see this. I'm going to give you this example. I love this story of the children of Israel when they're coming out of Egypt. God gives them manna to eat. So 
God tells them every day that they are to collect manna. And this manna fell from the sky and it was blanketing the ground and they were to collect a certain amount of this manna. And um, it was like bread. And they were only to collect it each morning for that day. If they kept it, it bred worms and it stank. So each day they needed fresh manna every single day. And if they didn't, this is what happens. It tells us in Exodus 16, 20, notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part until a part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. We need a fresh relationship with Jesus every single day. We need a relationship with him that's vibrant and fresh every single morning. Otherwise, we will stink. Our relationship with Jesus will be old and stale. And the depth of our relationship and uh, and the power that it gives us to share Christ wherever we go is only by spending that and having that vibrant relationship. We can see this. People will know when we are fresh. People will know. They'll be able to see Jesus in us when we have that fresh relationship, when we're taking that fresh manna every single day. And this is demonstrated. I love this, this verse in Acts. It's demonstrated by Peter and John in the book of Acts. They were already threatened by the um, Pharisees and the Sadducees, by the religious leaders, not to preach Jesus. They were told, do not preach in this name. Don't speak in this name. Don't come into the temple and speak in this name. But yet they came back into the temple and they saw a lame man there. They healed him in the name of Jesus. The lame man jumps up and he starts jumping around and praising God. Then they preach Jesus and 5,000 men come to the Lord. I love it. And then the religious leaders come and arrest them and pull them in. And this is what it says in Acts 4.13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled and they realised that they had been with Jesus because of how they were, because of the boldness and the courage and the vibrancy of their lives. They knew that they had been with Jesus. It was evident to them, even to the blind religious leaders of that time, that these men were like this because they had been with Jesus. It was a direct result. The boldness and the courage flowed out of them because of the relationship that they had. And it's the same for us too, this vibrant relationship to be bold and courageous To preach the word, to live that life comes from that direct relationship with Jesus. Having that relationship with the word. And I want to say too, again, going back to last week, these men were uneducated and untrained. If if we are willing, he is able. Please watch that message from last week. All we need is a yes All we need is a yes. When we are willing, he is able. So preaching the love of Christ always must come from the overflow of the relationship. It doesn't come from striving. It comes from the overflow of having that vibrant, vibrant relationship with him. So what is the message? What is the message that we bring? And I love this as one of my favourite verses in the Bible. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself, Christ, uh, uh, through us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation. That is the word that we proclaim. 
When we preach the word, we proclaim reconciliation to this world. We've been given the word of reconciliation. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. It's good, Peter. The gospel. It's the gospel. It is the gospel. It's the word of God. It's the good news. And it's what we're commanded to preach. God was in Christ. The creator of the universe was in Christ, reconciling, making all things right to himself. That relationship that was broken is now mended because of what Jesus has done. This is the word of reconciliation because of what Jesus did. We are reconciled to him. Our relationship is restored and our wrongdoings have been taken away from us. And, you know, Paul goes on to say in verse 20, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We have this ministry of ambassadorship. We are ambassadors of Christ. We represent him. Wherever we go, no matter what we are doing, we are representing Jesus. No matter where we go, we represent Jesus. And this being an ambassador means it's a 24-7 gig. It doesn't stop when we're in private. It doesn't mean we're different when we're in private. We are his representatives to our family, to our wives or our husbands. We are his representative in the way of life that we live. We don't live one way at home and then live another way out on the street. Come on. Good. We can't expect to live one way in that in the in their private place and when we're alone and then have influence when we go out. We can't expect to be one person at home and a different person outside because that's being a hypocrite, that's wearing a mask. Yes. If we're doing that, if we're being different. When we walk out the door, we're not going to be an an effective ambassador. And again, being a good ambassador, we must know the person that we are representing. We need to know what that person's values are. We need to know that person to be able to represent their interests. We need to have that intimate relationship with them so we know who we are representing when we walk out the door. And again, that comes back to relationship. How can you represent somebody you don't understand? How can you represent somebody that you don't know? You can't. You can't represent their values and represent what they stand for if you don't know it. when we're living lives with fresh men every day and we're walking in that relationship with Jesus every day, we can't help but not share Jesus with the world. Mm -hmm. It comes naturally. It's not forced. It just comes out of us. It's the overflow. We're living in the overflow. And when we go out into the world because we're so full of Jesus, we're the fragrance of Christ. And no matter where we go, or what room we enter, we bring the fragrance of Christ and we change the atmosphere of that room because of what he's done in us, because he comes out of us naturally. People notice the difference. They notice that we're different because we're living in the overflow and because that place of relationship empowers us. We are ambassadors and it's evident. It's effort. Effortlessly, <laughs> or it's not an effort to be an ambassador because that's what just comes naturally. I want to ask you today: what's stopping? What's stopping you from living this life? What's in the way? What's in the way of of the relationship that's necessary of walking this out with Jesus? What's what's stopping you from? or preventing you from having this intimacy with Jesus? What needs to go? What's taking your focus? What's robbing you of relationship with Jesus? What is in the way 
of you living this life in the overflow. Because the world needs Jesus if we don't represent Jesus. People are going to go to hell. We are his representation. We are his ambassadors. We need to bring Jesus to this world. He's the only hope. Mm. And we've got to be genuine ambassadors. Yes. This world needs genuine. This world needs real. And we're the difference. And we can bring it in the darkness. The darkness, the darker this world is, the brighter our lights are. And this world is looking for different. It's looking for life. And we must be that difference. We must be the life. We must be alive in Christ. We can't expect to make a difference if we're the same as the world. We can't expect the the world to want what we have if we're the same as the world. We can't expect them to, to think any differently of us if we're just bringing them the same garbage that they've already got. They don't want that. They want genuine. They want genuine. I love this quote from Smith Wigglesworth. I just saw it today. I had to write the end of this message differently. Um, Smith Wigglesworth, if you don't know him, he was an amazing, mighty man of God. He saw thousands upon thousands of miracles. When he was 50 miles away from the town he was travelling through, people were being delivered. People were being healed. I know a story of a guy that had one leg and he was in a wheelchair and Smith Wigglesworth walked past him and said, go buy a pair of shoes. <coughs> and, and the guy's like, what? And, and Smith Wigglesworth said, go buy a pair of shoes. So he went and bought a pair of shoes. The next day he woke up with two legs. Smith Wigglesworth was a mighty man. These are, these are not like uh, made up miracles. They are absolutely um, 100% validated miracles. Heaps of them, hundreds, thousands of them. Raising the dead. He was a mighty man. And this is what he says. The reason the world is not seeing Jesus is that Christian people are not filled with the Spirit. Or not with not filled with Jesus. They are satisfied with attending meetings weekly, reading the Bible occasionally, praying sometimes. It is an awful thing to me to see people who profess to be Christians, lifeless, powerless, and in a place where their lives are so parallel to unbelievers. Lives that it is difficult to tell which place they are in, whether they are in the flesh or in the spirit. That's the problem that was a hundred years ago, and it's the same problem today. The world can't tell the difference with a lot of us. And Smith was saying that we need to be different. We need to be, we need to be the fragrance of Christ to this world. I'm going to leave you with one last verse, 2 Peter. 2 Peter 2, 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises and through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world through its lusts Okay, so we're going to go back through this. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge. Knowledge, in the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. As his divine power, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to what? Life and godliness. Through what is it? Through the knowledge of him, through the knowledge of him, we can clearly see it's through relationship. 
It's through the knowledge of him that we are empowered to do all things. That relationship, knowing him through his word, reading his word, having the relationship with him every single day is so important. Having a genuine relationship in prayer, quality time with him, not a second afterthought. We need real relationship with him to be filled with Jesus. And this isn't a condemnation, but this isn't a message of inspiration. I want you to be inspired that when you're full of Christ, when you're living in the overflow, you are the difference. Each and every one of us are different. It's not an effort to bring Christ to this world when you're just saturated with him. When you're walking and you're living in the overflow, you can't help but spill Jesus out. When you go into the shops, when you go into your workplace, when you go anywhere in this world, you spill Jesus. You're living in the overflow. When you know his word, when you know the power of his word, all of his precious promises are yours. Through the knowledge, through the knowledge of the true relationship, when you know who God really is, when you know what Jesus really is, you can't help but be his ambassador. It comes easy when you know his power in you. You can't help but change and influence every situation that you walk in. You're the light. Yes. When the light goes into a dark room, it changes the atmosphere. That is each and every one of us. Each and every one of us has that power because all we need to do is just have that place of relationship. Then we influence the world. Like I said before, the world doesn't want the same. It doesn't want the same. We need to be the difference. We need to be Jesus to this world. And the only way we're going to do it is by just knowing the word, being in the word, having the intimate relationship with Jesus Christ every single day. It will come naturally. It will come naturally. Before I close, I just want to say to anyone out there that if you don't know Jesus, um, he, he wants to have that real relationship with you. Jesus Christ is real. Jesus Christ came to reconcile, to, to mend the relationship between us and God. If your life is missing something, if you're missing something in your life and you know that your life is incomplete, it's Jesus. Jesus, you're missing that relationship with Jesus. He's there. He just needs you to come to him and give your life over to him and say, Jesus, please forgive me for my sins because he died for your sins. He died for the things that you've done wrong. He will not count those things that you've done wrong through all your past. There's no sin that's too great for Jesus to forgive. He paid for it on the cross. All you need to do is accept that payment. If you're feeling that burning in your heart now and you need to, you need to be free from the things that are holding you back from the sins of your past, Jesus has paid the cost for it and he will forgive you. Please contact us. We'd love to hear from you. If you're coming back to... To God, it doesn't matter how far you've walked away. He loves you so much and he wants that relationship to be restored with you today. Don't wait. Tomorrow is never guaranteed. You never know when it's up. Don't wait and walk away. Today is the day for salvation. Today is the day for you to choose Jesus. He loves you. He loves you so much. And church, if there's anybody here that wants prayer for anything, we would love to pray for you today. And we have wonderful soup that I had nothing at all to do with. So, um, if you... have got the chicken carcasses and freezer downstairs. Oh, wait, I put them in the pot. All right, I had a little bit to do with it, a little bit. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions. Like, why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist.
28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning.